Hello and welcome to Chain Reaction, a podcast series examining America's role in the world. I am your host, Aaron Stein, the Director of Research at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. Every two weeks, we will talk to experts about a variety of topics and why they matter for U.S. foreign policy. Good afternoon or good evening, uh, depending on where you're calling in from. Um, My name is Aaron Stein, Director of Research at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Um, And today we are joined by uh, Michael Kaufman, uh, who's the director of the Russia team at the Center for Naval Analysis, uh, and Rob Lee, who is a senior fellow here at FPRI. And we're going to get a general sense of how uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is coming along uh, now that we're a couple of months into this. Uh, The way that this is going to work is that um, Rob and Mike are going to give some introductory uh, thoughts uh, for about five to eight minutes each, and then we'll have some moderated questions. question and answers uh, before we begin to integrate um, uh, uh, attendee questions. So with that, uh, Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you um, and uh, you can go ahead and kick us off. Great. So um, I, I usually uh, initially kind of start off with my views of what's, what's happening, kind of what, what I see going forward. Um, so my views haven't changed that much the last, I don't know, like three or four weeks. Um, basically, the, the Battle of Donbass has been going on for three to four weeks now, maybe a little longer. Um, it, you know, it, Russia's had some gains. Um, they're making some incremental gains today. It still isn't clear you know, that they can actually have, you know, significant success. Not clear they're going to be able to do any kind of real breakthrough that's going to be rapid um, or be able, you know, significantly cut off Ukrainian forces. Um, if they can't achieve that, it, it, at least in my view, I, I don't think Russia can really achieve really any kind of strategic gains there. And the big question was always, basically numbers. Did, did Russia have enough numbers um, and, and, and have a numerical advantage, you know, at at the strategic level, operational level, or even tactical level, um, it's sufficient to actually have success in these, these kind of offensive in the Donbass area? And, you know, I think in some cases they are at tactical level having that kind of superiority, but not enough to really be that significant. And that's why so far we're seeing um, relatively slow ad- advances. It's, you know, it seems to be quite costly. Some you know uh, photos today, yesterday of this crossing one of the rivers that, that seem to they seem to take really heavy attrition, um, which has been a kind of general point uh, of of just in general they, they had difficulties crossing rivers and taking losses, um, and, and it seems to be that's going to be the case in the future. And basically, because Russia when they invaded they invaded with 75, 80 percent of their their battalion battalion groups of their kind of permanent readiness forces, ground force units. And with that, they deployed with conscripts, they deployed with, with uh, Royal Guardia units. Um, they, they really didn't have much of a reserve. It, 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 they, they ran into trouble, right? We, we saw them beginning, we knew them beginning, and, and it, of course they did. And so even though they rebalanced the Donbass, Ukraine has rebalanced the Donbass too. And you know, it is, it, it, it's not clear they're gonna have that much success beyond kind of, kind of limited kind of gains by taking certain towns or certain cities. So the big I think, question right now, and I know Michael's gonna get into it in a minute, um, is basically, you know, Russia has three decisions or three options. They can either escalate, they can continue the, the, the war as, as it is, or they can de-escalate. Um, at the, the current path they're, they're proceeding with doesn't appear that they're going to have much success doing, you know, continue this, this path. You know, maybe they'll take more, more uh, territory in Donbass. It doesn't look like they're going to be able to take much, that much more um, beyond this unless they, do, maybe they make some kind of changes. If they escalate, right, the most likely option is mobilization. There are different kind of mobilizations and options they have, but there are huge risks that come with that. And it's not clear that mobilizing conscripts or reservists would be necessarily militarily that effective. And then if you try and de-escalate, um, there's no you know, reason to believe Ukraine would be you know, willing to end, kind of end the war um, to let Russia kind of de-escalate on their terms. They have every kind of incentive to continue this war and try and retake kind of territory that, Ukraine, that Russia currently holds. So the all three options, there are, there are risks associated with them. Um, not clear that any of them are a kind of clear exit strategy for Russia from this war. Um, the problem is we look about sustaining this war, even if Russia just wants to sustain holding the territories they have in Kherson and Kharkiv elsewhere, they're probably going to need to consider mobile, some kind of you know, mobilization, I mean, limited mobilization in the coming months, because right now they're, they're ready, their permanent readiness units have been committed to this war. They've, you know, they've been there for two and, a half, two, two and a half months. They've taken heavy casualties. They're going, to, they're going to become exhausted. Russia does not have enough permanent readiness units to do a uh, sustainable rotation. So that's going to become an issue coming in a few weeks. Is Russia going to make a decision about 
whether or not they mobilize in some regard or in some way change the current turn trajectory of this, this conflict, because it, it doesn't appear that's sustainable for Russia. It's probably more sustainable for Ukraine. Well, thanks, Rob. Um, Mike, why don't you just pick up from there? Sure. Uh, so first, uh, let me pick up on the four structure issues, which I, I've been highlighting for a while now, from my point of view, are in some ways very deterministic. You know, often wars beyond the initial operation, they're very difficult to predict, but they come down to manpower and material more often than not. And Russia has huge issues here, as Rob highlighted. So um, the force as it is was really not designed and not structured to conduct a large scale military operation of this type without raising the manning levels. The Russian military is a tiered readiness force by design, and there were conscious choices and trade-offs made within that. And I think we'll talk a bit later here, that force in practice in terms of readiness ended up being a lot smaller than we even thought going into this war with, with real discrete choices in there uh, that, that uh, made the Russian plan such that it maximized Russian weaknesses rather than actually dealing with the, the choices within that military. So looking out forward, while general mobilization, I always thought was a mistaken focus in the conversation because it's neither likely nor is the Russian military set up for any kind of mass mobilization. It's not the Soviet army. That's one of the big differences with it. But behind the scenes, there is piecemeal, um, let's say a shadow mobilization that has been taking place. Because what's clearly happening is Russian leadership is taking these partial efforts to kick the can down the road and actually making the situation in many cases worse for themselves. Because right now they're trying to raise manning levels by first, offering uh, uh, lucrative contracts for short-term service down to four months at a fairly sizable uh, payout to uh, anyone willing to serve. Uh, probably pushing conscripts to convert into contract servicemen so that they can be deployed and likely hunting for uh, new contract servicemen amongst those who are reservists or let's say in the bars reserve system as well. Um, all these efforts are going to simply uh, extend the problems they're currently facing. Uh, at the end of the day, their biggest issue right now is the political framing of this war. So because this war is a special operation, um, even though Russia is not a country where there's rule of law, it is an incredibly procedural state. And framed as a special operation, there are certain important considerations. First, Russia cannot deploy conscripts into this war. Although it's clear some units cheated early on, but there's over 250,000 conscripts in the Russian military, and they're not considered to be deployable for this kind of conflict because it's not a declared war. Second, Russian contract servicemen actually can refuse to serve and try to tear up their contracts because Russia is not in a state of war. Uh, and third, the state doesn't really have the ability to declare any kind of mobilization because to do mobilization on a larger scale, you would need to actually declare some kind of state of war or you need to change laws and procedures. And they haven't done any of these things. Right. So I'm not saying that the Russian political leadership needs to declare a state of war. That's the fastest and probably most unpalatable or riskiest solution for them. But then they need to implement big changes and they're not doing some of these things either. On the operational side, but I'd like to add to Rob's comments. It was kind of clear that early on, the Russian military was starting out with something like a double envelopment, trying to push forces towards Slavyansk and Kramatorsk and at least partially envelop them from the West, and at the same time, focus on the Severed Donetsk salient east of them and essentially try to cut up those two sections of the Ukrainian defensive line. That effort failed. It's pretty clear the Russian military doesn't have the forces. Uh, and for all sorts of reasons that we can potentially discuss, they weren't successful in making major gains in the first several weeks of this offensive. I suspect that's why Gerasimov showed up on the Zoom to personally change the direction of this operation. And it's clear that the Russian military has shifted the weight of the effort towards Severodonetsk Donetsk and has largely abandoned the pursuit of any advances from the Zoom. And that's, I think, part of the reason why we've seen these attempts to make river crossings along the, you know, across the Sviesky Donetsk River is because they're trying to essentially now focus on enveloping Ukrainian forces at Severed Donetsk by capturing Papasna, which is south of it, and also trying to push from the north to sever Ukrainian lines. Now, at least that seems to be what their operation plan is. Uh, obviously, they're, they're meeting a lot of resistance. 
And I think to some extent there's a debate, you know, what are the what are the real challenges behind the Russian effort now? Force availability is very clearly one of them. A lot of the force has been attrition. Having BTG counts now to me is, to be perfectly honest, kind of useless because we don't really know what end strength we're talking about. We're really looking at fragments of units and, and the BTG numbers don't really tell you about the kind of uh, force capability or density you're looking at on the battlefield. Uh, it's not clear what the situation is with morale. It's quite possible Russian forces are not keen to prosecute the fight or maybe not advancing uh, because of, of morale issues. And on the logistical side there, I think the story is probably better for them in terms of resourcing of the effort. And they have far fewer forces to support in this fight. They don't seem to be having ammunition issues, but that, that merits exploring. Uh, anyway, I'll close out on that. Um, i maybe turn it over back to you to, to get the conversation going. I wanted to come back to both of you um, to talk about this manpower issue. There was speculation, Mike, you referred to it, is that uh, Putin would use the May 9th Victory Day speech to call for mass mobilization. Now, I know, Mike, you were always skeptical of that, and obviously that didn't come to, uh, come to fruition. But you know, I think everybody wants to know is with these manpower shortages that you both have talked about is when will this force be exhausted? Are they already exhausted? And you know, if so, are they well set up for a war of attrition from where they're at now? I guess maybe I'll come to Rob and then I'll come to you, Mike. Sure. So you know, one thing Mike and I alluded to, we're working an article about the personnel issues in the Russian military. And you know, it, it was known that personnel was a problem, right? It was a weakness of the Russian military compared to other militaries. They didn't have an NCO Corps. You know, it, it was always a question of how, how many contract services they had. I know the issues about that. But it, it's, it's become even clearer based on some of these kind of captured documents about how extent the extent of, of, of the issues are personnel. And the personnel issues, um, in particular, there's a lack of infantry in the, in the Russian military. And so um, it, when, when they, they kind of dole out contract servicemen, right, the priorities for those jobs are highly technical skills and then NCO billets and then kind of elite units, right? So because the ground forces have the fewest um, like really highly technical skills that, 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 that are service with the most conscripts, right? So the Navy, all, all, everyone on a submarine is supposed to be a contract serviceman and other kind of technical roles like air defense and that nature. It takes more time to train so you can, a conscript can't do it. Well, you know, basic infantrymen, you can kind of get away with doing less training, assuming they might be useful or other jobs like being a driver, like a truck driver. And so the problem is a lot of these Russian ground force units, um, like logistics units, they couldn't find enough drivers or contract servicemen. So they rely on conscripts or rely on civilians in peacetime. And then lo and behold, when war happens and you can't deploy those conscripts, you can't deploy civilians, they had a, a significant lackage of contract drivers, right? Basic, you know, guys who are serving were basically privates who were driving trucks. They didn't have enough of them, so they couldn't man all these logistics kind of convoys. Same thing in infantry units. They didn't have enough guys to be, um, you know, it, 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 we, we focus on NCOs being the issue in the Russian military. In reality, they have enough NCOs. The problem is they don't have enough infantry uh, contract uh, uh, privates. And so because of that, right, the units are small and we expected. And basically, it looks as though they, they reduced the table organization for Russian motorized rifle units and other units to kind of uh, deal with these personnel shortages. And as they're increasing the BTG count, right, they, they reduce the size of these units, both in terms of TO, and even when, even when they reduce TO, you know, from, you know, maybe, maybe to like a 340, uh, 360 kind of man battalions, they weren't even manning that, right? They're, they're, they're only manning to have those battalions, two thirds man, three quarters man, that they actually deployed to, to Ukraine. And then the BTGs, right, when they actually formed it, we're seeing BDGs that are like 400, you know, 50 guys, 600 guys. So far smaller than what we thought they're going to be. And the, the variance is massive. So some BDGs are 450, some are 900, right? And so basically it's, it's how do you count these kind of things? It was pretty clear for a while that, you know, counting a BDG as one kind of unit when there's such a huge variation in size uh, it makes no sense. And in reality, a lot of these kind of uh, Russian battalions are, you know, more similar to say, you know, American reinforced co company as opposed to battalion. So the problem is those personal issues affect everything, right? They, they, they have a mass effect on logistics. Maintenance was, it was a problem. They didn't have enough guys to maintain vehicles. They don't have a dismount to fight an urban drain, right? All, all these other kind of issues. And, and, and um, it's a cascading effect across Russian military that it hurts every kind of uh, aspect about their campaign. And so now we're talking about, you know, how, how well can they um, sustain this war? Well, we know they can have attrition. 
the attrition was predominantly in these kind of elite units or units that had riflemen, right, or, or motorized, motorized rifle units. That means the share of the fighting now has, um, has increased as more the kind of DNR and LNR militias are, are a bigger share of the Russian force than in these regular Russian, you know, motorized rifle units. Um, and ultimately, a lot of these units are already treated. And so, they, you know, they, they deployed to Ukraine already at, you know, reduced strength. And then whatever casualties it took makes it much worse. And in reality, you know, they had somewhat ad hoc units. They were forming kind of squads the day of this war. They weren't told ahead of time. And now, you know, they're probably doing some of that again. And when you amalgamate units, right, they, they don't have time to train together, they're not cohesive units. They're much less effective. So all these kind of things are kind of like known issues about how you, you know, you, you want to fight or you don't want to fight, how you kind of form units. And, and the way kind of Russia went about this war by not telling a lot of these units ahead of time, and they already had these manning uh, issues, you know, right before the war started, they didn't have time to fix these issues or kind of think about how to fix these issues. So all, all that basically um, it explains a lot of what the problems Russia had in the beginning of this war. And then now why it's so difficult to kind of adapt and overcome just because they, they don't have the units. They never had the units to have a sustainable rotation if things went wrong. And units they did deploy already had issues right when they deployed in the beginning. So all those kind of things really affect what Russia can do. And it comes back to just saying, you know, th- that you can only adapt so much when you, when you start a war in such kind of bad terms. And it's remarkable, again, that at the high level, Russia was playing this war since, you know, at least July. Um, and, they, and they already put, put you know, pieces in place last March, a year ago or so. It's remarkable that, they, that you know, at the, the high level, you know, um, um, at Putin's level or other senior military level, they were playing this war and that none of this stuff was kind of pushed down to get lower guys. So they didn't have time to kind of think through some of these issues, how to mitigate these kind of weaknesses, these, these readiness problems, except, you know, until like the day prior to the war. And so all that kind of stuff comes back. And it's just remarkable the, the way they kind of went into this war and how basically or just senior leadership set the military up failure knowing they had weaknesses and didn't try to address them. Mike? Yeah, well, let me add to that. So, and I'll a little bit also, uh, I think, resummarize. So I, I have like to say, you know, show me your force structure and I'll tell you who you are. Military is left to write all these brilliant uh, uh, operations concepts, but force structure is very revealing and it has strategic effects on a conflict because when it comes down to who built the most hedge, what can the force do when things go wrong, what can the force actually do when the political leadership makes them uh, fight a war they didn't necessarily plan or train for, so on and so forth? A you know, force structure is going to have some pretty deterministic effects, right? So as Rob was saying, uh, the big choice on tiered readiness, but also cutting infantry in manure formations had a huge effect. The force on the whole had much lower readiness than I think we thought before the war. Definitely parts of the Russian system at least looked like they didn't know about this. So some extent what folks say, Hey, Russian mill now me, how come you didn't know the extent of the rot? I think I don't think the Russian military actually knew about some of the extent of the rot. Um, and not telling much of the military ahead of time that they were sending them to war meant that the various people who on the margins were uh, potentially cheating or misreporting couldn't fix this problem and couldn't adapt and couldn't reorganize in advance of a conflict because they didn't actually know that that's, that's what the military was going to do. A lot of things that I've seen kind of written in the last two months on the challenge of the Russian military, well, I can be honest that they're putting the emphasis in the wrong place. It's not so much the lack of NCOs and it's less an ability to do combined arms. How can you do combined arms if you don't have any infantry? Like you have no dismount infantry uh, to support tanks and tanks are operating without support infantry is operating without armor in some cases, so on and so forth. That said, I want to qualify by saying this picture seen a problem across the board, but also quite uneven, depending on what military district you look at. And different military districts came in with somewhat different force structure, and they seem to all have the problem, but it was uh, to varying extents, you know, sort of the, the gravity of it. Uh, so to answer your question, Aaron, uh, what does it tell us about the situation? Well, uh, I will kind of repeat, or well, at least some predictions I've made in recent weeks at first, This is Russia's last offensive operation in this war, because if you look at the attrition they've suffered and what the force is going to allow them to do, uh, independent of whether or not they make gains on the ground or this ends up being a costly drawn operation or they suffer a defeat, I just don't think that they have any further offensive potential under these conditions. 
Second, this war is not sustainable for Russia as a war of attrition, especially not with Ukraine's level of mobilization and access to Western conventional weapons and ammunition and logistics. Okay. Third, I want to balance that last statement, which is Russia does have options to extend staying power without any sort of general mobilization. That's why I always thought that was the wrong conversation to have. They can definitely extend their staying power in this conflict. It won't necessarily change their fortunes in this war, but they could do things to be able to rotate troops, to be able to bring additional personnel, and to have much greater staying power overall, especially if they're going to try to hold on territory they currently occupy, right? And where that takes us down the line, you know, we can debate. But I also want to put that out there as well. So I don't want to make it sound like, well, the Russian military has maybe no more further offensive potential. It's important to recognize that there's a good chance the Russian military isn't just going to melt away quickly either, right? And much of it depends on the political choices they're going to make and what point they make them. But if they do drag it out and essentially procrastinate, you know, Russian political leadership are the masters of halfway measures and, uh, and, and waiting to make, to make key decisions. And that's clearly what they're doing now. This is actually their, their MO. Uh, then they're going to make the whole situation worse. And what is a strategic defeat is going to, could become uh, a much more kind of a, a much more self evident and even uh, rapid and cataclysmic defeat for Russia, I think. So just, of course, everything in conflict is contingent, but that's just that's my sense of, of where it could go. You know, the, the other thing that, that I, I want to ask both of you is, is the level of Western support for the Ukrainians themselves. And we've seen a considerable increase throughout this conflict, I think sort of culminating in the, 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 the recent Lend-Lease um, provisions coming out of the US, I think to, to the tune of $20 billion worth of military aid, $33 billion overall, right? Can you talk a little bit about the effect of this Western support you know, for the Ukrainians themselves? And how that could help them, uh, I guess, maybe continue the fight or to withstand this last Russian offensive, you know, this last Russian offensive. So maybe Rob or Mike, if you guys want to take this, whoever wants to go first, it's up to you guys. Sure. So uh, if you look over the, over the course of war about the importance of, of NATO kind of weaponry, it's grown since the beginning. Right? In the beginning, Ukraine was fighting mostly with their own equipment and they, they're doing a lot, of, they're having a lot of success with that. The, the, as, as the conflict's gone on, you know, a lot of their stuff is, they obviously lost a lot of equipment. Um, they've run out of ammunition for some of the equipment. So, so it's, it's become, you know, maybe not as decisive, but it's become very, very important. In terms of Ukraine's ability to stay in this war, they, they're relying on NATO support. And it is being, I think from, you know, the way you're hearing uh, comments from Russian officials, they realize that it's basically the, the decisive, you know, one of the decisive things about, you know, whether or not Ukraine continues war, how this war will continue, is the level of, of support from NATO both in terms of financial assistance, ammunition, um, other kind of weapons, that things of that nature. Um, you know, one of the things that's really, it's really important right now is that the more this is a traditional conflict, uh, at least in the time being, it benefits Ukraine, right? And so Russia's having some offensives, they're having some, you know, limited success and some limited, limited gains, but they're taking attrition by doing so. And it means, you know, strategically, that's not necessarily a bad thing for Ukraine because the more attrition Russia takes, the harder it is to sustain this in the long term. Right, and, and it develops some kind of rotation of, of how they kind of hold the, the, the territory they already hold. Well, what's happening now, you know, Ukraine has, has M777 howitzers. The they, we, we, U.S. has been fighting wrap rounds, the long range kind of ammunition for them. They're supposed to be receiving Excalibur, um, uh, precision guided munitions for those rounds. All that stuff means Ukraine has a much better ability to have, just kind of do artillery fights. And part of the issue, too, is that a lot of Ukrainian positions at Donbass are really well entrenched really will, def will defend in positions. So they, they can take artillery strikes and they're not necessarily that, a lot of them are, aren't that vulnerable to, um, you know, one, five, two millimeter artillery rounds, unless you get something heavier or you have some kind of, it's, it's well coordinated to maneuver, right? So that, you know, you're suppressing and maneuvering on a target and you can't just kind of sit in a bunker. Well, the, the flip side is not true. Because Russia has to do offensive, they don't have the same kind of defensive um, positions. That means they're more vulnerable to indirect fire. And now with Ukraine, they're getting longer range artillery, more um, more accurate artillery. Not to mention, you know, they're getting, they're getting um, you know, we've seen evidence of brimstones being used, UK missiles, um, switchblades, uh, loader munitions, all those things that are very, very effective. They can be very useful as a force multiplier for like small units to have longer range kind of capabilities to strike it, at, you know, very, very accurately at different targets. 
all those things are good for Ukraine. And it means, you know, in my view, over time, uh, at least on the military side, Ukraine is going to be gaining more than Russia relative. And so, you know, the longer this goes on, the longer Ukraine gets more of these systems into, into service, long range systems, more accurate systems, they have, a, they have a advantage. And so, you know, the big emphasis, I think, for Ukraine right now is basically, you know, what's, what's, what's holding down the Donbass, not having too many losses, even if they lose some terrain, it's not the, it's not the biggest issue in the world, as long as they can keep attriting Russian forces. And then, um, you know, not, as long as they don't have any kind of disastrous, you know, loss of forces that get, get surrounded some of that na nature, I, I think they're strategically in a, in, a, in a good position because they can rely on this kind of NATO support. I really think that, you know, the statement from the U.S. and U.K., I think it was like two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, like, I don't remember, about basically how the, the objective is to ha let Ukraine win, right? Not, not just to kind of survive, but to win. That was a really important statement attempt because Ukraine knew they continued to be to have their, whatever equipment loss they had or ammunition losses they had, they, they could continue to get that backfilled by the U.S., by the U.K. in a kind of statement of attempt. And that meant that they could commit weapons to the fight in the Donbass. They might not otherwise in order to kind of, uh, you know, keep that in reserve in case, you know, th there's an offensive later on, they had to have that kind of weapon we with. So all that's, I think, really important. I think the, the, the extent of kind of NATO armed support and their kind of assistance has become much more effective and important than it was before. And you're seeing that from Russian officials because they're increasing their threats, realizing that this is kind of a decisive uh, a point of, 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 you know, uh, of importance, you know, for, the, for how, how well Ukraine can sustain this war for the rest of, you know, the time it goes. Mike, do you have anything you want to add there? I think that's generally right. Um, the trajectory of the military balance in this war is clearly in Ukraine's favor over time, given these conditions. And I think the situation for Russia is going to worsen as it goes on, as the West increasingly supplies new capabilities and is able to train the Ukrainian military up on them. Uh, that said, you know, it's it just clear to me that there's not going to be uh, some kind of stalemate in this war, that we're going to be seeing offensives and counteroffensives and territory trading hands. Uh, and that Ukraine has very strong counteroffensive options, right? And so for me, the conversation that uh, if the Russian offensive peters out, then we have some kind of stalemate in this conflict was always somewhat wrongheaded. The evidence just isn't there for those kind of assumptions. Uh, big picture, you know, if we look out in this conflict, not weeks or months, but maybe even more towards the end of this year or next year, you know, if you assume that there isn't going to be a sudden dramatic defeat of Russian forces, I'm just putting that out there. This could become a, a pretty drawn out conflict in terms of attrition and both sides pursuing a strategy of exhaustion, which is the West looking to exhaust Russia economically and to over time attrition Russian forces on the battlefield. But Russia also looking to exhaust Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has taken uh, losses that are not insignificant. We often focus on Russia, Aaron, but we almost never talk about what's happening with Ukrainian forces, in part because we don't know and we don't have good numbers on it. But the casualties on the Ukrainian side are also not small. First and second, Russia holds Ukraine in part under an economic blockade, right? both at the port of Odessa and also the access to the Dnieper River. And Ukraine is looking at at least minus 50% of GDP this year, and the alpha of a substantial percentage of the population. So this situation uh, is, from my point of view, very tragic, and it's likely going to play out at least for some time with both sides trying to exhaust each other and their respective political will. Uh, I think on the whole, the balance of the equation is very much favorable to Ukraine, at least in the current trajectory of this conflict and with the extent of Western support. Mike, let, let me stay with you because this has come up a couple of times in the Q&A uh, sort of indirectly is um, and because you mentioned it is if you're looking around, you know, what are the places where the Ukrainians could perhaps you know, launch a counteroffensive you know, and place where they could retake territory that's lost, you know, and will they suffer their own problems <laughs> crossing rivers? You know, like we've seen that with the Russians, you know, do they have their own issues as well that they would have to deal with, you know, in this in this sort of you know, strategy of exhaustion that you were talking about? Yeah, sure. So the two logical places are around Kharkiv, which has already taken place. You've seen an extended Ukrainian counteroffensive to push Russian artillery away from the city. And that was its primary objective. There's a real uh, sparsity of Russian forces around that area, as we said, because Russian general has a real shortage of manpower. Uh, I also see strong options for Ukraine 
southwest around Kherson City, where Russian forces are trying to maintain a defensive perimeter around the city, which is on the western side of the Dnieper River. And there they also have a dearth of, of force and battalion tactical groups. And I think it's possible that over time they could actually be forced to retreat, give up Kherson City, and essentially kind of blow the bridges and try to draw a defensive line on the eastern side of the riverbank and hold on to what parts of Kherson and Zaporizhia they managed to occupy. You're, you are absolutely right, though, as Ukraine goes on the offensive, you know, ground warfare, uh, the defense is favored and attrition typically favors the side that's defending tactically. Right. That, of course, all depends on painting with a broad brush here. So, of course, it won't, it won't be without exacting a toll. Uh, and yes, they, they too will have to cross rivers and they too will have to uh, figure out how they deal with Russian defense. Um, and actually, as they go on the offensive, Russian air power might become more effective in those situations than it currently has been trying to establish local air superiority and trying to provide uh, close air support, which is pretty limited in what they can do in that role. But, you know, that being said, uh, Ukraine has substantial manpower. And I think some of that may depend on whether or not they choose to uh, launch offensives now or if they actually choose to sort of wait and build up to assimilate more Western equipment, put together reserve brigades and the like. And last point on this is that, at least so far as we've seen it, this has generally been an artillery war. That may not be how it looks like on the internet, all right? And there's a lot of focus on javelins and in-laws and the like. Those are certainly uh, part of the equation when they've slowed, slowed down Russian forces. But the bulk of the attrition Russia has suffered and the bulk of the damage, uh, the things that really stopped Russian advances has been Ukraine artillery, effective use of Ukraine artillery. And the Russian artillery's general inability to suppress Ukraine artillery fires. So part of this will really depend on who has the fires and who is the sustainable logistics and the ammunition and the ammunition supply? So one of the big, I think, uh, game changers for Ukraine is steadily now getting off of uh, Soviet artillery calibers, which you can only scrounge so much from Europe, okay, from warship pack countries that have Soviet artillery ammunition left over, and onto U.S. NATO standard calibers and munitions where the United States is able then to provide uh, the ammo. For their to, for sustained artillery fires. Well, Rob, something I want to come back to you on is on this Manning issue, um, and I guess it'll be for both of you. Is like the news of the day, and I guess it's the news of the week. Is like the imminent application of NATO membership for Finland and Sweden, right? And the expected inclusion of those two countries in NATO by the Madrid summit, which I believe is at the end of June. You know, if you look at the overall rates of attrition in the Russian armed forces. Mm-hmm. How are they well prepared, perhaps, or you know, thinking about broader conflict with NATO, like for, with these manpower issues that you see, that you guys uh, talked about at the front, and like more broadly, like how that applies to those frontline states in the Baltics, Poland, and Romania, and beyond that, you know, their own not, uh, equipment rates of attrition in terms of uh, PG uh, precision guided munitions uh, that have been used during this fight, and whether or not you guys think that they're dipping into their stockpiles that they have set aside either for contingencies against NATO. Uh, or for the uh, the nuclear role. So maybe I'll go to you uh, first, Rob, and then I'll come back to you, Mike. Sure. Um, so when you look at the way Russian military is structured, it's well structured for a short, high intensity conflict where there's some maneuver, where there's not like a lot of occupation, not a lot of those things, because they, they have those kind of personnel weaknesses. They don't have the forces for that. Um, but they're well structured to do, do a lot of damage, right? To inflict a lot of damage, you know, conventional terms, they, they have that capability. Um, and, 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 and so we talk about some of the kind of NATO. Um, you know, Russia conflicts, some of the things, we're, the issues we're seeing with Russia in Ukraine is, is because they're trying to occupy a country that's very difficult to occupy. And occupations are always difficult. And, 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 and you know, Russia can still do a lot of damage if, if it is a, a conventional conflict that didn't involve that kind of, um, you know, goal of occupying cities, occupying a lot of terrain, doing those kind of things. The Russian military is going to be weakened for a number of years. And, and it's going to take a number of years to reconstitute already what they've what the, the issues they've had and it's only gonna get worse long as conflict goes on and so you know they already have personnel going into it we already know that at this point um you know the bgs they, they were they were talking about you know 168 bgs um as part of the russian military well okay these were you know formed from battalions that are smaller than we thought so the actual capability is less than we thought at this point 
They've lost a significant amount of force. The, the cows they've taken have been disproportionately on initially on those permanent readiness PDGs, in particular VDV units, naval infantry, spets dots, all those units have been really heavily hit. And it takes time to reconstitute those kind of numbers. As we said before, personnel is the biggest issue, and it's going to be a huge issue reconstituting quickly because every year, um, the way Russian military uh, recruits you know, servicemen, they have, they have a draft. A certain number of draftees every year decide to sign a contract. Some stay in a, a unit. Some go to a different unit. But they, re they require a certain percentage of guys every year to sign a contract. Well, currently serving conscripts, I, I would bet, are going to be less likely to sign a contract right now. The guys currently coming on who just got uh, working and drafted right now, the, the Russia deployed a lot of the training officers and units that are supposed to train these guys. And so a lot of them are not going to be trained that well necessarily. A lot of them, I bet, would not sign contracts to. And there's going to be a bunch of knock-on effects. As long as war goes on, the, the personal issue can be worse and worse. And so it's going to take time to recover from this. It's going to be an issue. You know, we're going to hear more stories about guys who were, you know, sent to war without knowing it, you know, based on the training exercise, that data finally go to war. Guys are not going to necessarily want to, you know, stay in the military on these kind of conditions. There are a lot of leadership issues, a lot of other kind of just, um, you know, the way this war has been structured, it's something you wouldn't trust yourself serving in a military wanting to go to war that way because of the way this kind of war was thought about, the political goals, everything about it, right? It, it, it was, it was a, a kind of a blunder for a lot of reasons. All those kind of reasons are going to make it even tougher for Russia to recruit contract servicemen going forward. They already had issues. We already knew they plateaued. Um, they, 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 they were not reaching the targets they, they've, been, they've been trying to reach the last four or five years. Well, it's only getting worse at this point. And so we talk about, you know, what could Russia do in the future? Well, first off, as long as war goes on in Ukraine, the, the majority of Russia's ground forces are committed to that conflict. They, did, they, just, they don't have the ability to do much more other than fight in Ukraine and then kind of a holding pattern elsewhere. And so, I mean, again, the fact that they deployed battalions from uh, Tajikistan, from Abkhazia, Sosetia, Kaliningrad, all these kind of sensitive areas really shows kind of the problems they're facing. And, and apparently they're, they're, they're redeploying this from Syria to Ukraine too. Again, just comes back to that issue. So the Russian military is going to take a long time to recover the personnel problems they're having right now. When we talk about equipment losses, those are significant too. And it's going to be an open you know, debate. How well can, they, can the Russian OPK um, replace tank losses, helicopter losses, uh, other aircraft losses? You know, they're not having a, I think, significant effect on Russia's ability to fight the war right now but it will have a significant effect of the Russian military's capabilities in the future because so much of that equipment is gone. And a lot of these are some of the best systems. All those things are significant questions. They said about PGMs, Russia's fired more than I thought they'd be able to fire in this war. Um, but, you know, a big part of it is they're launching a lot of the long-range munitions, but not necessarily the short-range ones. So, I mean, caliber cruise missiles, KH-101s, um, you know, Iskander, M, uh, you know, cruise missiles, tactical, tactical ballistic missiles. You know, I don't know how many they have left. It's hard, I think, I think to predict that. But certainly, they've, they've run through a lot of stocks. And the means in a, in a NATO conflict, they don't have those kind of numbers available. And we know they're having some accuracy issues, which means you need more of those to kind of, you know, be sure you can hit a target. All these things just contribute saying Russia's in a really poor position to fight a conventional conflict anywhere right now. Um, as, as long as Ukraine, the war in Ukraine is going on and it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon, it's going to be a problem. As long as, you know, Russia tries to, continue to occupy Kherson, Kharkiv, other areas, it's going to be an issue. And even if they, 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 they end the war and somehow can, can uh, pull those forces back, it, they're still going to be in a very poor shape to fight a conflict in, in Finland, anywhere else. And so, you know, it, they, they basically, it, 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 in the last 10 you know, years or so, they're probably in a weaker state right now. They've been a number of years to fight any kind of uh, conventional conflict. And, and it's going to be that way for a number of years to, to take, to reconstitute themselves. I want to address first a little bit about why I'd end up in a situation that ideas do really matter in the military and the Russian armed forces they were conducting period reforms really kind of assumed that they weren't going to be doing strategic ground offensives, that this was largely a thing of the past in terms of Cold War uh, military doctrine and that they didn't need either the logistics for sustained ground defenses because where were you going to be really doing them in Europe if you just even look at the potential outlines of a Russian NATO fight and uh, beyond the logistics, they wouldn't need the manpower either, that there, that there wouldn't be manpower needed to hold substantial amounts of terrain. And they sort of assumed they'd be fighting on a fragmented battlefield, maneuver formations that emphasize fire strikes and enablers, 
and things like air defense. And so they didn't focus on urban warfare. They didn't build out the manning structure to hold territory and the like. And, and they assumed the hedge they built into the force was that in the event there would be a large conventional war, that there'd be advanced warning and political leadership would give them time to conduct partial mobilization, raise the manning level for a larger fight. That was kind of the hedge they built in. Um, so so the, both the, the framework of, of uh, the war that the political leadership launched in Ukraine uh, totally blew that assumption on the water, or the fact that it was sort of a secretly organized special operation, but also the fact that they fundamentally assumed that they wouldn't be sent in a war like this. And here they ended up going in, trying to do a number of strategic ground defenses along three different fronts. And you, and you can see uh, what, what a debacle it, it, it ended up being. Um, so the other thing I'd like to add to, to Rob's comments is that from my point of view, probably where they are right now, equipment is an interesting debate. I think it's a bit less of an issue. I think that the main thing they've lost are tanks and uh, infantry fighting vehicles. But to what extent they can produce additional ones with the resources they have or pull out relatively comparable ones from storage is worth discussing. Aircraft and helicopters, they've lost a bunch, but not that much. I mean, they've lost in many categories, maybe one year's worth of production. Equipment, they've lost several years of production, but we can debate uh, what the constraints will be on uh, the Russian defense industrial complex moving forward and how much they'll be affected in replacing these losses. The long range precision guy munitions, I am also a bit surprised by. So I suspect that maybe they had bigger stockpiles than we thought going into it. I mean, that's kind of the problem is that you, you don't really know what they started with. And so it's hard to predict if they're running low or not. All the folks in the last two and a half months have said they're running low. And even I've been guilty of this, actually, in recent times, looking at some of the munitions they're using, um, I think have so far been wrong. And they seem to they seem to still have a substantial part of cruise missiles, either that or they really are digging into their reserve and in capabilities that, that we might have expected they would hold on for nuclear employment missions. Uh, to me, I think the problem they're having is more targeting than actual uh, the missile capability itself and the missile performance. And the last point I'll make is on manpower and force structure. Here, I think the real issue is, is that. And it's a big question as to what is the Russian political leadership going to do? Are they going to extend the draft, right? Are they going to go from a one-year draft for conscripts to a longer draft? Are they going to increase the share of conscripts in the force? They might have to if there aren't enough contract servicemen now signing up to go into this military. Are they going to conduct a partial mobilization? Um, if the Russian economy really tanks, and it clearly is going to go down uh, probably well over 10% of GDP this year, and they offer substantial money in lots of areas in the regions, that money actually could prove quite lucrative to people to sign, uh, sign up for contract service. But it depends. The, the main, uh, I think, takeaway from, for me is that I don't think they can go on like this. They'll have to make significant choices. There will be a real dent to the Russian force, there'll be a real dent to the reputation of the Russian military, obviously in the international stage, but also domestically. And that, yes, it's fair to say that the Russian military is gonna need quite a few years uh, to recover from this. And that's just saying that now, we don't know if we're you know near the beginning, middle, or, or towards the end of this conflict at all. Uh, this could actually get a lot worse for the Russian military. Let me ask you, Mike, and I'll come back to you, Rob. Um, if they're on the verge of, say, annexing the Kherson, the, the Kherson region, right, which I think we all agree that they are, or at least they're considering it, how does that impact with these overall broader um, manpower issues that, 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 that have been the theme of this entire discussion, right? So if you're going to annex territory, you're going to take it, then presumably you're going to occupy it. Do you still have forces to do what you need to do in, in, the, in the Donbass? So, Mike, I'll start with you, and then I'll come to you, Rob. To manage that, they're probably going to bring in as much as they can from Rose Guardia, or actually Russian police and other auxiliaries, and most likely start a recruitment program to see if they can actually hire uh, people within these regions or employ some of the security structures that existed there beforehand. Uh, overall, the Russian military lacks the manpower to hold this terrain. That's so why I was suggesting that if Ukraine successfully launches counterattacks, they will have to retreat and consolidate around something that's more defensible. Right now, their biggest challenge isn't just holding the strain, it's the fact that behind these forces, 
there isn't a clearly build out plan for how they will rotate these troops. How will they get these troops eventually off the line, replace these units with other units, and so on and so forth. I think as Rob accurately stated, what you've basically seen is the entirety of what is available in the active duty force at peacetime strength deploying this conflict. And a significant percentage of it get attrition such as combat ineffective and get pulled off the line. And so now Russia's fighting with um, a force that, well, I don't know, this is one analyst's opinion, if I have to throw a dart at the board, this is effectively maybe no more than something like four divisions in terms of actual combat strength of what's on there. And uh, that force is, from my point of view, going to be insufficient. Definitely insufficient to hold that ter territory, especially if, if there are uh, sustained Ukrainian counteroffensives. And uh, in terms of occupying holding the terrain, well, the more they actually try to gain in the Donbass, the bigger that challenge will be down the line for them, right? So we're not only, I think, in a place where this looks like the last Russian offensive operation under these constraints, but the more territory they try to gain, the more territory they'll ultimately have to try to defend. Uh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, I think the problem for Russia at this point is that there aren't really good prospects for them to inflict more loss on the Ukrainian military than they would sustain these offensives. And if that's the case, whatever terrain they take, it, the question is strategically, how does it really change Russia's position? And, it, 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 you know, it, it, it is politically useful to take some of the parts of Donbass to try and make it cohesive, but ultimately, shooting low, it's, it's, you know, it's not as useful. And if they take losses in doing so, it's not necessarily um, should be that useful. And it hurts the kind of sustainability of this operation. Um, in terms of holding hurts on, right, it is, it is certainly a legitimate question of, of how well they can do that. Um, when the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003, it used about like 37, 38% of its, its maneuver battalions. Um, and and, and like, a little over 40% if you count Fourth ID, which wasn't used initially. Well, Russia went in with, you know, 80% of it. And so, and the U.S. had, had National Guard and didn't deploy initially. Those are more military-type structure than the Russia's National Guard. And, of course, Russia invaded with the National Guard as well at the beginning. All of that means, right, the U.S. could, could, could a, uh, develop a kind of sustainable rotation that Russia can't, just based on numbers. And then Russia took heavy casualties. The, U, the U.S. did not take in, in, in OAF-1 either. All of that just means, sustainability-wise, it's a huge issue. And we talk about how... Russia would integrate her son. It's also a question of, you know, they, they, it clearly was not, a lot of this war was not thought out. A lot of it was not um, pushed down to lower levels to think through how, how do you do these different operations? How much, you know, planning went into how do we, you know, occupy her son? How do we make it part of Russia or what's the long term plan? And I don't, even, you know, even up until, um, you know, end of March, I don't think occupation was, was the plan. I think you know, Russia was happy to kind of. Uh, of uh, return it if they got their kind of political goals achieved. So it, it's still a very big question of how do they make this work? How do they make it economically work for those regions? You know, it, it, you know, it, are they are they setting the stage for insurgency there? Even if the Ukrainian military can't take it, I don't know. But it, it doesn't seem to me it's a very sustainable solution. And, and at this point, Ukraine has every incentive to kind of continue this war because they have legitimate reasons to think they have the upper hands. Things are going their way. Time is on their side. You know, there's a question with the economic aspect, but the other side of it is certainly a question about how sustainable this war is for Russia. And so as long as that's the case, it's, it's, it's going to be an issue of can Russia continue to occupy these areas, hold them, and try to end this kind of conflict in a, in a you know, I don't know, suitable, suitable way. There's not a really clear, uh, clear exit strategy, at least in my view, for Russia at this point. I think that's a huge problem for them. And so, you know, not clear where this goes at this point, but, you know, as we are saying, the, the current trajectory of the war uh, I don't think Russia can continue as it is. Um, they're going to have to make some kind of choices to escalate or de-escalate in some respects. In some ways, it kind of resembles um, kind of strategic procrastination at this point, where the, you know, there, there are a bunch of reports from guys who are um, Russian correspondents embedded with Russian forces or, or some of these kind of telegram channels run by, by some Wagner um, veterans, and, and not, not to mention Igor Girkin, guys who have a better understanding of what's happening with Russian forces on the ground in the situation. And they, for, you know, for a month, a lot of these accounts who are, who are you know, pro-war, they support our position in the war, they've been saying Russia does not have the infantry, they do not have the num numerical advantage, and they have to make a change, or otherwise the war is not going to be won, and, and basically continue to kind of 
you know, continuous war, but they're not going to actually have much more success. Well, it's clear that, that, that a change has to happen at some point, but it's not clear what Russia is going to do because of those risks. And I think, you know, it's clear. I think, I think we looked at um, the Victory Day Parade. It, it was noticeable that basically Putin didn't really reduce, he didn't raise the stage for reducing the goals of conflict. Like he didn't, I don't think he talked about Mariupol. I don't think he kind of just sell what Russia achieved so 